During the first decade after Chandler's founding, a massive influx of settlers resulted in community leaders struggling to provide adequate public accommodations. Their desires to build an outstanding school system were challenged by crowded classrooms and lagging financial resources. But Chandler's community members were dedicated to providing the best education possible for their children, and town leaders needed a successful school system to attract more newcomers and businesses to the area. So they persisted in their efforts throughout the decade and ultimately succeeded in 1922 when they constructed one of the finest high schools in the state. At the time, the school system was led by its seventh superintendent, Mr. Fred Austin. Professor Austin's 17-year tenure at Chandler Schools was characterized by dedicated community involvement and expansion of educational services. Austin was known for widely promoting the school and the achievements of his students. Under his leadership, Chandler High earned accreditation by the North Central Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools for the first time in 1923. Austin's leadership and ideas helped the Chandler community prosper during the 1920s and into the 30s. He was heavily involved in activities for the Chandler Chamber of Commerce, and he served in the Chandler Rotary Club as well. It's impossible to tell the complete story of Chandler schools without delving a bit into racial segregation. It became the law of the land after the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the legitimacy of segregation laws in 1896 and the Arizona territorial government encouraged segregation with a law in the first decade of the 1900s. That was well before Fred Austin's administration, but Austin and the school board did establish policies and practices that segregated African-American and Hispanic students for decades. African-American students were bused to black-only schools in the area. Elementary students attended Booker T. Washington School in Mesa, and secondary students went to George Washington Carver High School in downtown Phoenix. Spanish-speaking children were treated somewhat differently from blacks. Neighboring districts had built schools specifically for these students. With this in mind, a group of Chandler's Hispanic citizens persuaded the board to build a school for the children in their neighborhood. The district opened the Wynn School in South Chandler in 1929. It served for more than four decades, and was finally sold to the city in the 1970s for recreational use. In the mid-1930s, the nation was severely handicapped by the Great Depression. To help ease unemployment and stimulate the economy, the federal government created a number of work programs to carry out public projects across the country. Superintendent Austin was diligent in his efforts to bring some of those resources to Chandler schools. Government work programs built Chandler High School a new tennis court, and provided new bleachers and enhanced lighting on the athletic field. Federal money paid for work and materials. The high school district provided only worker supervision. Fred Austin chose one of his most prominent teachers to supervise the workers. His name was Wilfred G. Austin, but everybody called him Bill. When Superintendent Fred Austin retired in 1937, the school board selected Bill Austin as his successor. Despite common misconceptions, the two men were not related. The new superintendent was a native of Arizona. He grew up in Chandler and Tempe and was actually one of the first students to attend Chandler High School upon its founding in 1914. Bill Austin attended Arizona State Teachers College and the University of Arizona. The district administration hired him to teach biology, industrial arts, and physical education in 1926. He also coached Chandler High's athletic teams. When Bill Austin took over, the country was still trying to recover from the Depression. Austin continued to take advantage of federal work programs. He used government-provided resources to build a new gymnasium at Chandler High in 1939. The district remodeled the original gym to house industrial arts and agriculture classes. As in everywhere else in the country, Chandler people were affected by the changes that occurred when the nation entered World War II in December 1941. Many Chandler High School boys and even a couple of Austin's teachers joined the armed forces and went off to join the fight. But the major challenge for Austin and the school board at the time was a substantial increase in enrollment. This was the result of the U.S. Army Air Corps opening Williams Airfield just nine miles east of downtown Chandler. The children of the base's construction workers and support personnel were spread among East Valley school districts. 
Growth from the base also filled Mesa schools and forced them to discontinue accepting Chandler's African-American students. Bill Austin and the board decided to use the old Goodyear School for Chandler's black elementary youngsters. High schoolers were still bused to Carver High in Phoenix. The end of the war in 1945 brought a flood of veterans and their families to Arizona, and Chandler shared in the post-war population boom. The following year, Chandler's enrollment grew by 25%, and the community passed a $34,000 bond election to pay for new property and school improvements. Austin persuaded the board to use some of these funds to buy a strip of land on Erie Street to the north and west of Chandler High. Growth projections released in late 1947 indicated that student numbers would soon overwhelm the schools. So in early 1948, the community passed additional school bond elections totaling $350,000. The board and Superintendent Austin rushed to build a substantial expansion to the grammar school and a home economics building at the high school. Both facilities were ready when school started in 1949. The Chandler Grammar School campus, consisting of old and new buildings, was renamed the Cleveland School in 1953, after the board adopted a policy of naming schools for the street on which they were located. In the summer of 49, Superintendent Austin received a call from the principal of Carver High School in Phoenix. Austin was informed that because of increased enrollment, Carver no longer had space for students living outside the Phoenix Union District. Austin made the decision to integrate the district's African-American high school students into Chandler High beginning that fall. Elementary students were also eventually integrated into the main campuses, but not until 1954, after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation based on race was unconstitutional. The district kept growing at a steady pace, and in 1950, it once again had a critical shortage of primary grade classrooms. As was done many times before, Austin organized classes into half-day sessions and rented classroom space at the Methodist Church to help alleviate overcrowding. He had anticipated the problem and was working on a plan. At that point in time, nearly a quarter of Chandler's enrollment resulted from the impact of Williams Airfield, which became a training base after the war. This entitled Chandler schools to federal assistance for school construction. The application process was somewhat complicated, but Austin persisted. He proposed a 20-classroom junior high school and athletic field to be constructed on the district's Erie Street property. His efforts paid off, and the federal government pledged $289,000 if the district raised the remainder of the needed funds. Voters went to the polls in May of 1951 and passed a bond election for $250,000, which guaranteed the federal funding. Chandler Junior High School and the new Chandler High Athletic Field were ready for use in early 1953. For his insight, dedication, and leadership benefiting Chandler schools, and for his responsible management of the public's money, the Board of Trustees officially named the new athletic field in honor of W.G. Austin. This was the first time a district facility was officially named for a person of significance. Superintendent Austin and the Board of Trustees spent much of 1954 and 55 shopping for property. They closed their first land deal in October of 55, paying $18,000 for 10 acres on Hartford Street. Voters passed a bond election in early 1956 for construction, and Hartford Elementary School opened the following year. During the remainder of the decade, Chandler Schools built Denver Elementary School, which opened in 1960. The high school district added a new agriculture building and a new wing on the north end of the Chandler High main building. The late 1950s brought a surge in federal and state regulations on public schools. District operations became more complex as numerous state and national funding sources were offered for new public school programs and classroom practices. School boards began establishing official governing policies and operational guidelines for their districts. This was the period when the administration of Chandler Schools began to grow. The board authorized an assistant superintendent to relieve Austin of some of his workload. As growth continued into the early 1960s, the board and superintendent spent much of their time shopping for property and asking voters to pay for land and school facilities. A 1961 bond election paid for Galveston Elementary and a pre-planned expansion of Hartford. A substantial bond election in 62 paid for classrooms and cafeterias at Denver and Galveston elementaries 
as well as a music building, large gymnasium, and swimming pool at Chandler High. The pool was built in partnership with the city, which it used for recreational purposes on the weekends and during the summer. Several of these projects were plagued with construction mistakes and supply problems, and the roof of the Chandler High gym collapsed during construction, injuring four workers. Lawsuits resulting from the accident went on for several years. School started in the fall of 1964 with a district enrollment of 3,900 and increasing. Along with the Board of Trustees, Superintendent Austin and Assistant Superintendent Kenny Knox organized a Building Proposals Committee to study growth projections, determine school needs, and make recommendations for constructing schools. The committee proposed adding more classrooms to Hartford, Galveston, and Chandler Junior High, plus buying property and building another elementary school. They also recommended converting the newer Cleveland School buildings for high school use and demolishing the original grammar school buildings, which were in very poor condition. On that property, they planned a new Chandler High Industrial Arts Complex. Also, since the Cleveland School had an auditorium, the committee suggested remodeling the old Chandler High Auditorium into a new library and classrooms. The board and administration went along with the committee's suggestions they also added a district administration center to the list. This building was called the Chandler Educational Service Center, and it opened in 1967 at the corner of Galveston and Iowa Streets. That same year, W.G. Austin decided to retire after 30 years as superintendent of Chandler Schools. In his place, the board promoted assistant superintendent Kenneth Knox. Knox, in turn, selected the junior high principal, Ted Perry, to fill his vacated position. Knox and Perry started off by creating three new district level positions, an administrative assistant to manage budgets and construction bids, a supervisor for the intermediate grades, and a director of pupil personnel to manage special education programs. In the fall of 1968, voters passed a bond election for the construction of a new elementary school in addition to some other projects on the building committee's list. At the time, Team teaching was trending nationally as an effective education method. The technique called for larger classes with multiple teachers. As the board and administration planned the new school, they decided to try the method. So they custom built Erie Elementary School to better facilitate its use. Erie was meant to be a replacement for the old Cleveland School. So shortly after Erie opened, the newer Cleveland School buildings were annexed and remodeled by Chandler High and the original grammar school buildings were demolished. In the early 1970s, Chandler began another wave of new school construction to keep pace with district growth. They were all funded by bonds approved by district voters. This time around, the Board of Education changed the school naming policy and began the upheld tradition of honoring prominent families and noteworthy people of Chandler. First came Knox Elementary in 1974 then Willis Jr. High in 1976, and finally Fry Elementary in 1979. In the middle of the decade, the state government finally passed legislation allowing districts with identical boundaries and common boards and administrations to unify. Up until this point, Chandler schools existed as two legally independent districts, Chandler Elementary School District Number 80 and Chandler High School District Number 202. On June 10, 1975, the Chandler School Board voted to merge the two districts, creating Chandler Unified School District No. 80. Unification of school districts was actually suggested by Dr. A.J. Chandler himself more than 60 years earlier, but to no avail. Dr. Ted Perry took over the superintendency from the retiring Kenneth Knox on January 1, 1976. Perry recognized that technology and computer innovations were poised to change public education forever, and the new superintendent made his choices accordingly. He selected Dr. Irvin Nikolai as associate superintendent. Nikolai had a background in technology and was working on educational applications just prior to being hired by the district. Toward the end of the decade, the district experienced a bit of a decline in student numbers. The operations budget was reduced and several teacher contracts were not renewed. 
This turned around in a big way after a relatively small and little known company called Intel chose Chandler as the location for its microprocessor manufacturing facility in 1978. Throughout the next decade, more high-tech companies followed Intel's lead and moved into Chandler. These companies needed engineers and scientists for their workforces. So Chandler school board members stepped up and set high standards for staff and student achievement. Dr. Perry worked with teachers and administrators to establish advanced academic programs, including AP and dual credit courses and the International Baccalaureate Program at Chandler High, as well as a program called CATS for academically gifted children at the elementary level. Dr. Perry and board members standardized curriculum across the district and instituted programs to help all children learn. They partnered with Chandler Gilbert Community College to establish an alternative school for academically advanced high school students. And they sought funding and donations to make Chandler Unified one of the most technologically advanced districts in the country, integrating computers into classrooms and among staff. Unyielding efforts towards these goals by the district's teaching staff and administrators earned the district numerous awards and special recognitions. Throughout the decade, many district schools were named among the best in the state and in the nation. When Associate Superintendent Nikolai left the district in 1984, Ted Perry and the board promoted Chandler High Principal Howard Conley to replace him. Dr. Conley had a superb reputation as an administrator having led Chandler High to recognition as one of the nation's best secondary schools. As all of this was happening, the district began a new wave of school construction to keep pace with growth. Weinberg Elementary opened in 1983, Anderson in 1984, Humphrey in 85, Shumway in 86, and Goodman, along with Anderson Junior High in 1988. Support facilities and a larger administration center were also erected in 88, and the district entered a 50-50 partnership with the city of Chandler to build and operate the Chandler Center for the Arts, which opened in 1989. When Anderson Junior High opened, Chandler Junior High School students and programs were merged with those of Anderson and Willis. The district then added the old Junior High campus to Chandler High School. It proved to be a valuable resource over the years. It was used to ease overcrowding at Chandler High and it even served to substitute for entire school sites when delayed construction schedules resulted in delayed opening dates. In 1988, Assistant Superintendent Howard Conley reported that school enrollment had exceeded 10,000 for the first time. The district was excelling academically and growing very quickly. Its reputation was being used as an incentive to persuade corporate leaders to open businesses in Chandler. It seemed CUSD was earning the full support of civic and business groups district-wide. However, a budget override renewal election in 1988 failed, indicating the district still faced some community relations challenges. Voters in the growing retirement community of Sun Lakes turned out in mass, and an overwhelming number voted against the Chandler School's override. Turnout in the remainder of the district was relatively sparse, certainly too light to counter the Sun Lakes vote. As a result, Dr. Perry and his administrative team had to make some difficult choices. The override failure meant a 10% loss of operational funds, and the district workforce had to be reduced. While faculty and staff for almost every department were affected, the loss of school nurses and athletic programs drew the most community attention. The school board called another override election for May of 1989, this time, board members and administrators were determined to communicate district needs and reasons for the override to the Sun Lakes community. Parents and community members also got involved to a greater extent and persuaded more voters to go to the polls. These efforts resulted in the override passing by a slim margin, restoring district operation funds. This entire election process played itself out again when the board approved a $36 million bond election for February of 1990. The plan was to sell these bonds to pay for the next wave of land purchases and new school construction. Once again, Sun Lake's voter turnout overwhelmed the rest of the district and the election failed. Once again, the board approved another bond election, but this time reduced the amount to $32 million. 
Once again, parents and community members got more involved to encourage voter turnout. And once again, the election passed by a very narrow margin. Soon after the bond passed, the board entered into contracts to purchase land and prepare architectural plans for Jacobson Elementary School and Bogle Junior High. On July 1, 1991, Dr. Perry retired and Dr. Howard Conley succeeded him as superintendent. Conley selected Dr. Camille Castile as associate superintendent and Dale Hancock as assistant superintendent of instruction. Dr. Castile was a former elementary school teacher and curriculum specialist. She was also the principal that opened Weinberg Elementary and led it to national recognition. Dr. Perry had transferred her to the district administration where she worked as assistant superintendent of elementary education beginning in 1986. Dale Hancock was a former Chandler High teacher and coach who resigned to run for the Chandler School Board in 1971. He left the board in 1975 when Dr. Perry and board members chose him to open Willis Junior High School, which he led to national recognition. A decade later, he headed the transition of the ailing Denver School into the very successful San Marcos Elementary. The first item on Dr. Conley's agenda was to find ways to better manage expanding enrollment yet conserve taxpayer money. His team began looking at a couple of new ideas. One, adopting a multi-track year-round school calendar. And two, adapting other district school designs for Chandler rather than starting from scratch to design and build each of the district's new schools. He also worked with the school board and community members to study the long-term needs of Chandler High School, which resulted in a proposal for a thorough campus renovation. Of course, all these ideas were implemented. Associate Superintendent Castile guided efforts to create a year-round school calendar, which was eventually adopted by most schools, beginning with Fry and Galveston in 1993. Adapting other district school designs began with Sanborn Elementary in 1992, and a thorough reconstruction of the Chandler High School campus was finished in 1996. It included preservation of the original building, and it gave the school enough space to manage growth at the secondary level while a second high school could be built. The board created another cost savings measure in 1992 when they invested in a central kitchen. It permitted school meals to be prepared at a central location and then transported to the school sites for heating and serving. This saved the expense of operating large kitchens at the schools, plus it gave the district a money-making catering service. In 1995, the board hired an architect to adapt the Sanborn school model for the district's 14th elementary. During the months of construction, Superintendent Conley reminded the board numerous times that the school needed a name. It seemed strange to him that nobody ever brought forth a suggestion. Then in April of 96, the school board surprised Dr. Conley and named the new school in his honor. Dr. Conley retired that summer just as his namesake elementary school was finished and preparing for its first year. The Chandler School's governing board members then conducted a national search for a new superintendent. They interviewed many candidates and concluded that the best person for the job was the district's own associate superintendent, Camille Castile. Dr. Castile took over on July 1, 1996. Over the course of that summer, Chandler's population kept growing, and when school started in August, enrollment was up by 800 students from the time school dismissed for the summer. Conley Elementary was nearly full when it opened, and the district needed additional elementary schools and another high school. While the community had passed a $70 million bond election the prior November for that very purpose, lack of action in the state legislature created issues with the district's bonding capacity. This, in turn, forced a six-month delay in the district's ability to fund new school construction. The district finally broke ground on Hamilton High School on a warm, sunny day in February 1997. The 15th and 16th elementary schools followed later in the fall. They were later named Bologna and Tarwater. The three new schools were badly needed. Construction time was short and any delays could cause problems when school started. So Dr. Castile and her team worked closely with the contractors to get the schools ready to open for the 1998 school year. The construction schedules for Hamilton, Bologna and Tarwater schools were complicated by El Nino rains combined with a shortage of construction workers and materials, 
and a lot of people had to work many long hours to have them ready in time. But it all worked out. In July, the school district finally received occupancy permits late in the week prior to the start of school the following Monday. Parents volunteered to help school faculty members, administrators, and warehouse workers move in and set up all the furniture and equipment for the three schools over the weekend. They got it done, and schools opened on schedule. Hamilton opened with a less than full support staff, and it was odd to see members of the district superintendency and school board serving lunches and working as crossing guards that busy first week. As the board and administration maintained a constant effort to design and build schools during this period, they also committed to the long-term needs of the district's technology infrastructure. They executed a four-phase plan to bring high-speed networking technology to every district classroom. The process included staff training on use of network applications for communications, research, student information, and instruction. Enrollment increased by 1,700 over the summer in 1998. In August, the board began the process of building the district's 17th elementary school. Named Basha Elementary, it would be a new model for the district, but still a site adaptation of an existing school. It would also be the first Chandler school partially funded by the state through the Students First program. The school opened in the year 2000. At the turn of the millennium, the district was fully immersed in its hyper-growth period. Basha School was followed by Hull Elementary a year later. When school started in 2001, district enrollment exceeded 23,000. It had doubled in 10 years, and the growth rate was projected to continue. So building continued. The Santan K-8 campus opened in 2002, followed by a third high school named in honor of Eddie Basha Jr. in 2003. Next came Hancock and Navarrete elementaries, and then Payne Junior High in 2005. Ryan, Fulton, and Riggs elementaries came next, followed in 2007 by the fourth high school, honored with the name of former superintendent Ted Perry. The construction of Haley and Patterson elementary schools and Hill Academy rounded out the decade. Now, the late 1990s and early 2000s defined a period when charter schools started to gain momentum and popularity. As Superintendent Castile and her team saw this happening, they realized that revolutionary changes were beginning to occur in the K-12 education market. They knew that if Chandra Unified was going to seriously compete, it needed to adapt. Dr. Castile formed a parent advisory council to help determine the educational preferences of district families. The group surveyed the market and pointed out programs that the district might offer to more readily compete. As a result, the school board approved a new traditional school model for the district. The first Chandler Traditional Academy, the Liberty Campus, opened in 2002. It quickly gained popularity among parents and soon there was a waiting list for enrollment. So the district expanded the Traditional Academy program, opening CTA's freedom and independence within a few years. Eventually, Goodman and Humphrey elementaries were also revised to follow the CTA instructional methods. This move revitalized enrollment in two of the district's aging neighborhoods. As CTA students advanced through the grades, parents began requesting that the district offer a more academically rigorous program at the junior high and high school levels. The district's first offerings in an enriched secondary program came with the opening of Hamilton Prep in 2007. It offered a small school setting with high expectations to academically talented students. The school was set up in rented space in the Chandler Christian Church. An additional offering to CTA parents came in 2009 after Chandler Unified performed a massive renovation on the old Chandler Junior High School building. The old school opened once again as Chandler Traditional Junior High to serve students progressing out of elementary level traditional academies. The Chandler School Board turned its attention once again to Chandler High School in the early 2000s. In the designs for the newer high schools, the board and administration had created minimum standards for space and accommodations. As it existed, the Chandler High campus was deficient in terms of general campus size and student areas. The board also felt that several of the campus's very old facilities needed replacement and as a whole, the school needed additional parking and modifications for traffic flow. The problem the board and administration faced was that Chandler High was landlocked being surrounded by either busy public streets or residential neighborhoods. 
After carefully surveying the situation, the board and administrative team made a controversial decision. They proposed condemning private property adjacent to the campus and annexing it to Chandler High. The community overwhelmingly supported the idea and approved bond funds in 2002, which allowed the project to move forward. Chandra Unified invested in a new vocational education building for the school and demolished the old one for parking space. It also added new athletic accommodations and a new competition swimming pool. These facilities were complete and ready for use in 2005. That first decade of the millennium, as Chandler Schools built new facilities to service its growing student population, the board and administration surveyed the district looking at other needs and potential areas of concern. District build-out was expected within a decade, and the school board and administration wanted to upgrade its facilities for long-term use. They made a list and asked voters to approve bonds to pay for multiple projects. The community was generous and passed a substantial bond election in 2006. Among the district's projects, it funded an extensive renovation of Willis Junior High, half the renovation costs for the Chandler Center for the Arts, a new teacher resource and training facility, expansion of the district administration center, and improvements to the technology and communications infrastructure. As time progressed into the latter half of the decade, the board and administration faced some new challenges. Chandler Unified continued to grow, but mainly in the south and east areas. Student enrollment at some older schools in the north was trending downward. The administration needed to find some way to revitalize the declining north. At about this time, parents of Hamilton Prep students came forward to speak to the school board. After several years of operating in rented space, they believed the school was ready for a new building of its own. They had a point. The school had grown popular with parents and was ranked one of the finest secondary schools in the state. Dr. Castile and her team devised a plan that improved declining enrollment in the north and provided a new facility for Hamilton Prep. They surveyed the schools in the northern part of the district and selected Erie Elementary to be the new home for the prep school. The board approved the idea and used bond funds for an extensive renovation of the school. It was renamed Arizona College Prep Erie Campus and it was ready for students in the summer of 2012. The board also refashioned Chandler Traditional Junior High to be part of the prep school program, naming it Arizona College Prep Oakland Campus. Superintendent Castile and the administrative team kept looking for new ways to revitalize the declining north region of the district. For several years, parents of students enrolled in the CATS program had suggested that the district create a school dedicated to teaching it. With the dwindling enrollment in the north, the administration studied the issue and selected Knox Elementary School to house a CATS academy. Administrative team members worked out a gradual transition plan to minimize the impact on current Knox students and families. And the process began with CAT students moving into available classrooms in the fall of 2011. At the turn of the decade, the economic recession was the cause of many challenges for the district. The state reduced operational funding for public schools and eliminated capital funds altogether. In Chandler, Growth didn't stop because of the recession, it just slowed down. So teachers had more students to teach with fewer resources to do the job. In addition, without capital budgets, there were no building maintenance funds available and some district facilities were on the brink of falling into disrepair. There was only one thing the school district could do to keep things running, ask the voters for help. Even in poor economic times, Chandler voters were generous and approved a bond election in 2010. It funded the construction of Carlson Elementary School in 2012, as well as a land purchase for another school in the Southeast. It funded building maintenance and renovations. It funded enhanced campus security and better monitoring on school buses. And it funded improvements and updates to the district's computer and networking systems. As the Chandler Public School System passes its 100th year, it begins a second century with a reputation of being a high-quality organization that promotes positive character values combined with high expectations for academic achievement. This reputation was created over many years and is the result of foresight, innovation, and the spirited efforts of the thousands of teachers, staff members, administrators, school board representatives, 
parents and students that actively endeavored to build something good. As I look to the future of the Chandler School District, I have many hopes, but many more questions. Like what long-term effects will our efforts and accomplishments have on the communities we serve? How will the socio-political movements of today affect public education in our state? Is the foundation that we've built sufficient enough to serve the needs of future students? I'm certain my predecessors that lived and worked here during the course of the past century would have had a similar list. To them I would say thank you for laying the foundation for excellence and putting us on a path to success. Today the Chandler School District has a reputation for being one of the best educational institutions in Arizona and we are working on being identified as one of the very best in the nation. Reaching that pinnacle would certainly give us an advantage as we prepare for the challenges to come. There are four major challenges we can anticipate and prepare for. Others are more obscure. Certainly, the social, political, and economic situations are ever-changing and difficult to predict. I believe the future stability of public schools in general will greatly depend on government representatives at all levels choosing to support public schools as a place where all students have access to quality education accompanied by an appropriate funding level. Secondly, there is one significant challenge in our future that we know is coming. Over the decades since Chandler's founding, our school district has been growing. But at some point in our near future, we will reach build out. The population will level off and our century long growth spurt will end. When that happens, the annual increase in maintenance and operation funding that resulted from that growth will also end. So new funding challenges will certainly be a characteristic of the district's future, as will our resourcefulness in finding new revenue sources. I also think that another major challenge will be the acquisition and use of technology. It will continue to be an important tool for school districts in the future. We have already seen it open doors to a whole world of information and new instructional methods. Maintaining a modern technological infrastructure and keeping our staff trained on its use will be a persistent and costly undertaking. Finally, I foresee a growing concern in finding people who are highly qualified to teach and want to devote themselves to working with our youth. Because there's been so much criticism aimed at our profession, and generally teacher salaries are low, fewer college students are majoring in education. The reality is the best and brightest are not choosing education as their field of study. So it will be a challenge to prepare our young people for the demands and requirements of the future workforce. I am sure there are many more challenges, but I'm an optimist. My hope is that CUSD will always have a visionary and progressive governing board that puts students first, values public education, and supports accountability based on measurable outcomes. My hope is that future district leaders embrace the caring and compassionate culture we have created and foster relationships with our employees, families, and community. My hope is that our district educators will continue to address the needs of the whole child and not just focus on their educational needs. And finally, my hope is that all the families that live within our boundaries will entrust their children to our care.